Wow, Robert, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And it's really good to be here. I see so many faces that I, I've met before and honored to be. Thank you, Rachel, for hosting this event for us today. Uh, as I was driving here, I felt, wow, little Neil is giving the Schiller Lecture. Now, all my career, or well, most of it, I've been in awe of people who have given the Schiller Lecture, starting with Sir Peter Newsom in 1977. And then last year we had the marvelous uh, lecture that I listened to the other night um, from Nancy. Absolutely incredible journey that we've been on uh, over the years with NAEP. And Christian Schiller, well, I've had his book at home in my study, and I had another copy uh, that I used to keep at school, too. And it was a, a book that I would dip in and out of to talk with teachers about. So if you haven't got your copy, do get one. It's really good. He said lots of things. Um, this one, for instance, which I've used so often. And much of Schiller I use and forget that it was his words originally. But I've always said that primary education isn't a preparation for anything else. It's a, a stage in its own right. And Schiller was the first one to say that. And he then went on to say um, that really we should be looking at what are the, the activities, the experiences that we are going to give to children. It isn't about standards of attainment, which of course is a lot about English education now, attainment, ticking boxes, being inspected, and all that sort of thing. Uh, Schiller was an inspector, but he didn't conceive of inspection in the way that it's done now. Um, I've been so inspired by so many people during my career um, this man, some of you have mentioned to me this evening before, uh, Len Marsh from Bishop Grossetes College, who was at the forefront of the Schiller thinking. Not only he, but Peter Lurway in Buckinghamshire, John Coe in Oxfordshire. They were all people that really believed in first-hand experiences for children, enabling children to really experience the world so that they could develop as rounded human beings. Um, as you said, I, I work quite a lot abroad. Now, I've, I've never met this gentleman because he died a few years ago. Let me get back to him. Here he is. Yeah. If you ever want a copy of this book, I can send it to you by email. So just let me know. This is a great Ukrainian educator. And I think it's very right that I should mention a Ukrainian educator today, Vasily Sukhomlensky. Uh, Sukhomlensky's work influenced primary education throughout the world, in the USSR, Russia, and into our own country as well. A lot of the early, really inspirational thinkers in this country have a lot to thank Sukhomlensky for. So I won't say more about him today. I, I hope I've whetted your appetite. So this man I want to honor today, um, Richard Howard. He gave the Schiller Lecture in 2001. And I worked with Richard for many years in Oxfordshire as a head teacher and later, latterly uh, working with him in the advisory service. And in his lecture, he did me the honor of obliquely referring to values education uh, because he was aware of what I was doing uh, to develop it at that time. So the development of values education in a school provides the underlying principles of what is a good school should be about. Now, let's come to here. Bannock Burn School. That was the first 
entrance I think I went through and that's what I saw and of course I was delighted at the bottom because you come out and you say you are a values-based school there are now thousands of values-based schools around the world these are schools who explicitly say that they are values-based most all schools are values-based you can't avoid being it but there are a certain number and a growing number of schools that say yes we are a values-based school and as you said I was delighted to give this school the enhanced quality mark as an outstanding values-based school why audience is now laughing because I'm showing members of staff um, Bannockburn school has quality it is a quality education that you see here. The senior, uh, senior leadership team, they all model the values of the school. Now, I went into this particular singing lesson, and I thought, wow. One of the things I've always said as an educator is that what I have hoped I've done with children is to inspire them to enjoy being educated, to really love learning, and when I watched this lady, I don't think she's in the room, is she in the room? No, um, I did. So let's see what I saw that day. This is enthusiastic teaching where children are set up for the day. enthusiastic teaching and learning so that we have happy people one of my concerns as I go around the world is mental mental ill health and I feel in a school such as this one you create an environment in which we can live healthily and openly and honestly uh, there's a lot of care in the system absolutely brilliant now, let's start the values-based journey. What was the journey? Well, it started for me at a school in Oxfordshire. I went to Cullum College, a teacher training organization in those days. And the final teaching practice was a whole term. You went for a whole term to a school. And I was lucky enough to go to South Stoke Primary School and worked with the most phenomenal head teacher called Peter Long. Peter Long was so inspirational. I just watched him all the time. And I remember thinking, if one day I can be nearly as good as Peter, then I'll be delighted. I watched him in the playground with the children. I watched him at every moment of his teaching. And uh, I just had the most fantastic time uh, during that period, which set me up for my career. So I was very fortunate. I went uh, to a uh, school in Swindon and learnt the craft, as it were, and then I went on to various headships and then on to be an advisor for Buckinghamshire, then uh, the principal advisor of the Isle of Wight service. And then I had one of those road to Damascus feelings. I was talking to a group of colleagues similar to you and there was a lady at the back of the room that looked really bored and I thought why is she bored I'm trying to be inspirational but the more I tried and I used all my techniques as a good primary teacher the more she tutted she went <coughs> and I thought what's she going on about so I tried even harder and then this penny dropped I suddenly thought well I know what she's thinking she's thinking if he knew anything about what he's talking about he would actually do it. He wouldn't just talk about it. So at that moment, I decided to give up being an advisor and return to a headship. And I found this wonderful school 
called West Kidlington School that had just burned down. Someone had put a firework through the front door and burned it down. So I, when I took over, the school was coming out of the ashes. It was being rebuilt. And what happened was a phenomenal thing. People often say, well, you started, Neil, values-based education. Well, I always deny that. It was the school community that started values-based education that my wonderful colleagues, both teaching and support staff, were the ones that enthusiastically embraced our work. Uh, this is one of our pupils underneath the globe. And what that's saying is that the children's values will hold up the world or the world will, will collapse. I am passionate about values underpinning the curriculum. I worked at the same time as running this headshot, headship with uh, Professor Richard Pring at Oxford. And I turned this into a research project. I wanted to see if we introduce values to children at primary school, would it improve the quality of education? That was the research question. And what we found, of course, was it did. I wrote a book called From My Heart, Transforming Lives Through Values, which was about not just this school, but about all the schools that I had come across by that stage that were calling themselves values-based schools. Because values-based education is from the heart. Of course, it uses the brain and the cognitive senses as well, but it's really driven by that sense of the heart. And I have said for many years that the heart is in danger of going out of education. We've become so cerebral, so tick-boxy, so inspected, so everything. Instead of saying, what are really the needs of children and how do we give the children what they need at their stage of development? And colleagues in the room, this is not a criticism of you, because I think you do wonders within the present system. Uh, another book that uh, my wife and I wrote, which has really gained, gained traction throughout the world, and that's the inner curriculum. The inner curriculum is about the internal world of thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And it's so interesting to me that most of the leaders in education around the world, colleagues in Norway, Sweden, who are developing the inner development goals. Because now we are suddenly, after 200 years since Descartes, we're realizing that the internal world of people is equally important as the stuff we give them. So we've got to sort out what's happening in the internal. So this book goes some way to helping you think about what should your inner curriculum be for the children in your school. A very recent book, which my colleagues led by Bridget Knight, who's the CEO of Values-Based Education, has produced this book. Because often people in subjects, working with subjects in school, say, well, where are the values in our subject? Well, of course, they thread through everything. So this book I do recommend as our latest book to you on the subject of values. Now, that's the two pieces of research, one I've referred to already this evening. Uh, but my small-scale research at Oxford University was really taken on then by Professor Terence Lovett in Australia, who then looked across a large sample of schools of the effect of values education. Um, I was a regular visitor for 10 years to Australia. Uh, they thought I was an Aussie at one stage uh, because I was helping them embed in their schooling system. Sadly, it went out of fashion when the Back to Basics movement hit Australia, as it did this country and also in uh, America. But I'm pleased to say I've just returned in December from Australia, and there's now a renaissance. Singapore, for instance, that I spoke in 15 years ago, 
is the leader in the world of what was thought of, of you know, giving children a, almost a force-fed diet. But now they've changed. Guess what's at the center of the Singaporean curriculum? Values-based education and character development. They've completely changed. I'm just urging the country here to make similar changes. Now, here's another teacher. This is Ledbury Primary School in Herefordshire. Julie Rees, the head teacher, outstanding work that they do. So, if you ask me what is values-based education, it's quality education. It's giving children the experiences they need to really be fantastically educated. What you're doing in a values-based school is creating culture. So people often say to me, is value stuff a program? No, it's a philosophy of education. It's a philosophy of how you create a culture, a holding vessel in which you can drop aspects of the curriculum into, in which children learn. This is to remind me of Goethe. The words of Goethe, German philosopher, have always rung in my ears. He said, and I paraphrase now, because he didn't actually say what I'm saying, because I use the word children. If you take a child as they are, you make them worse. If you take a child as they could be, you make them capable of becoming what they could be. So if I see one of you as a child, as, oh, what's the point of working with you? You're just like your brother and sister. They were useless too. If I see you as that, that's what you become. But if I see that spark in you of someone who can actually do anything you want to do, within limits, obviously, then you will become that. And that's what we need educators to, to do, to be inspiring, to inspire children. At the heart of a values-based school is good relationships. Deep listening, deep listening. Um, I was listening to Otto Sharma, a great educator, thinker in the world, and he was saying the most crucial thing you do as an educator is to listen deeply. How much time do you teachers give to listening to your children rather than talking at them or organizing them? Deep listening, so important. The next thing is the ability to connect. Adults who can connect with children become great educators. It's that process of forming a bridge between a child and yourself really makes a difference. Look at this guy here in the photo, getting down to the children's level and considering how he, you, will model the values of the school and yourself. Rene, a lovely Australian teacher who I've observed on a number of occasions, she has the quality that I think is so important I haven't got time to discuss with you today what that quality is. But look at her eyes. What do you see in her eyes? They're shining eyes. Have a look at the person sitting next to you. Have they got shining eyes tonight? Have a look. You at home, have a look at, in the mirror at your own eyes. Are they shining tonight? Thank you, yeah. You can always tell someone who's a, who's a really good... Uh, educator, teaching, non-teaching, doesn't matter. If the eyes are alive, then you can communicate. Because it means you're open. You're not weighed down with the baggage of, oh dear, isn't it a dreadful day? It's cold today. You're going out and you are influencing in an open way. This is all based, of course, on the work of Carl Rogers, who many of you will know about great psychologists, psychotherapist. Be genuine yourself. I cannot be anybody else now than me. I don't try to be anybody else. I often walk into a room and watch a class 
And as soon as the teacher knows the visitor is in the room, the person changes. They start performing and be yourself. That's so important. When I first started talking about the need for reflective practice in schools, many people thought I was going off the wall. I'm so pleased that research is now showing that this is so important. Giving children time to be still and to think, to be inwardly thinking, this helps with their critical awareness, being a critical thinker. So if you don't do this work, and of course it's become an in thing with mindfulness now, but really think how you're doing. If I've got time, I'm going to give you one tip on this. Let's take you to a real school that I was in. Now, being in London, you don't have the opportunity to have a forest as a part of your classroom. This is a real forest, and this is Lee Batson, with his children. Now, Sukum Lensky, all the educators I've talked about tonight, they gave children experiences. What is Lee doing in this photograph? He got all the children to lie down. It's raining. Have you ever felt raindrops on your tongue? That's what he was giving the children the experience of. Absolutely incredible. What did our friend Sh Christian Schiller say? Knowing when to help the children. Key skill of a teacher is not to interfere with learning, but know that moment when the child actually will benefit from you. Lee's great at doing that uh, with the children. So what's the value? Let's come to values. Most adults, when I ask that question, freeze. They freeze, they think, oh my gosh, what is a value? I was down at Zooch School, lovely name, Zooch School in Wiltshire, and I was talking with year one reception children, and I walked into the classroom, I said, hey everybody, can you tell me what a value is? And the girl in the picture looked up at me and she said, a value is a principle that guides our thinking and behavior. That was the school's mantra. That's what they taught the children, so that they could begin their journey of understanding, knowing what a value is. There are two types of values, generally speaking. There's this sort, the limiting values. Limiting greed, jealousy, lack of respect. We can name them all. And those, if you have too many of them in a society, as the Barrett Foundation showed, will bring a society down. It brings individuals down, but it also brings society down. If you have the other sort, which are called enhancing values, then the opposite, opposite is true. Everything gets better. So that's what we're developing in a values-based school, are putting the emphasis on enhancing values values. What is values-based education? This was a school, by the way, at Shepherd's Bush that transformed itself through values-based education. Values-based education focuses on universal positive human values. All the great religions of the world agree about them, so whenever I'm talking about these in a, a religious group context, they say, yes, we go along with that. We can see them in our religion. Or if you aren't a part of any religion, you will say, yes, these values are really important for society. Respect, tolerance, empathy, determination, justice, all those are universal positive human values. They need discussing what do you mean by those values? Do they fit certain contexts differently? All the politicians in the world will say they are driven by values, but what sort of values are driving their thinking 
and their behavior. Now, what my own research showed is that if you give children access to these values, you develop in them a special language, an ethical vocabulary. I'm told by many people that if you don't do it within schools, children don't naturally pick up this ethical vocabulary. So a school like Bannockburn says, well, we've got these values, let's give the children an ethical vocabulary, which helps their thinking and their behavior. It develops what I've termed ethical intelligence. Gardner in the States had a number of intelligence, and I say, and you can disagree with me, that ethical intelligence is the most important intelligence to develop in children. What is it? It's the ability to ethically self-regulate your own behavior. To ethically self-regulate your own behavior. I'm on record at saying uh, things like writing for the G20 summit leaders that without ethical intelligence, we cannot solve the great challenges of the world, such as climate change, because our leadership isn't ethical. So I'm now beginning to call out people who aren't ethically ethical in their thinking. So I'm not the most popular person in the world at the moment, as you could appreciate. So at the heart of a school, I would now advise that you put ethical leadership as one of the main, if not the main outcome of your curriculum. We would transform society over the next few years and world society if we could work from that base of ethics. So that's what we create, is ethical leaders. Wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? How do you introduce values? Well, you don't issue a list of values to the community. So many schools say, the head says, well, here's some values, give them out, so they've got five values. That's not the way. You have to involve the community at every level. Have a forum. Discuss what are the dispositions you want for the children. And then, this is a Swedish school, by the way, values-based school in Sweden. So think about what you want. So at the forum, parents will decide these are the values, and it can be discussed by the governors and others, and then those values are then adopted, and they can be those. That's 22 values, which many primary schools use, not those particular ones. But if you do as a primary school, then you can use 11, the first set of 11, one year, one a month for one year, no value in August, because we're on holiday, and then the second list the following year. This is a spiral curriculum. So by the time children reach year six, they have a deep understanding of these values words. Some schools prefer to have five core values and other values working to those five. There are lots of ways of doing it. The important point is that you make sure that you've got enough values to develop the ethical vocabulary with the children. Remember though, it's not, the important point is that it's not just having these words, talking about them, the important thing is living them. Living them in the school, outside of the school. Giving your children challenges. There's a school in Morecambe where the children said, we want to do something about the war memorial. And the head said, well, write to the council. They wrote to the council, council said, we've got no money. So the children said, we will raise the money to repair. So their values went into action. The end of that story is the, the council felt rather ashamed and gave some money to help the children. <laughs> then, by the time children are, are 8, 9, 10, 11, then you can lead them into ethical dilemmas. St. Peter of Gout School, what a lovely name that is, in Lincoln. 
um, I, I went into year six, and they were looking at ethical dilemmas. And what I'm going to show you, I often use with adults, with surprising effect. So let's look at an ethical dilemma. The science teacher has left the answers to the test out on her desk. Your friend says, oh, I'll copy them. I'll share the answers with you, and then we can all go out to play. And you don't like, you don't like uh, science very much. Hands up the audience. How many of you would take the answers and go out to play? Oh, they're all looking at each other now. <laughs> Can I tell you that the majority of audiences, 85% of people will cheat? That's my experience working with adults. They will cheat. Well, interesting, but that's the reality. Teachers, of course, in a values-based school, don't cheat. And that's what the children said. Um, I was in that school with someone, and they said, oh, the children are just saying they won't cheat because you're there. And the children were really put out. They said, no, we have been learning about values since we were four and five. We really believe that it's important to be honest and have integrity. Now, how do you create a values-based school? Here's Pat Wood, an Enfield head teacher. And she's working. And the important thing is that you start with yourself. Start with your own values. What are your values? So if you're the leader of the school or the leadership, you have to think, what are your personal values? What, as you walk around your school, what are you giving out? Are you giving out love? Or are you giving out criticism? Or a combination? So really interrogating your own values base. And then you go on to think about and that's Pat's value, by the way, of the month behind her. Then you think about your personal behavior. Do you walk your talk? I've been in schools where the head teacher has said in her room, oh, we believe in cooperation here, Neil. You'll see everyone cooperating. And then members of staff will say to me, no, we don't. We do as we're told here. Quite different. So checking out that you are authentic in your values, that there's alignment. And then we come to everybody else. Gr the group's values. Are they in alignment with the senior leadership teams? Are the school values the same as the personal values? Is that in alignment? And then you see the group behavior. And then it's, so it goes around the mission of the school. The routine structures, the way we line up in the playground, everything has to relate to the school's value system. You cross-reference your policies, everything. Now, I know through experience that if you get that right, if there is alignment, something magical happens. And the magic is this. What happens is you have harmony in the school, which is underpinned by trust. The best schools, the best companies, the best organizations I ever go into are those that are, have trust. Those that aren't so good have fear running. And my complaint about the present system in England is that is it's too much fear-based. Fear-based. Ofsted's intention is not to create fear, but from my experience, it does disastrously create fear. And you can challenge me on that one. How do we maintain mental health, which I think is the number one challenge for schools and society in our country? How do we do it? We give children, as this girl in Sweden, space to pause and to be. We give them brain breaks. I'd love to give you a brain break now, but I won't. A brain break is just a time to go inward. I've written a, an article, and you're all welcome to it. It's quite a big article, on something called the pause powers. I would like to see every school in the world adopting the pause powers. Very simple. P is for peace. How do you create peace in yourself? 
deep breathing. Take 10 breaths. Needn't do it now. Take 10 breaths. And what you find is if you take 10 breaths, your system settles. You have a feeling of peacefulness. It might take some practice, but that's where you get to. Once you've got that, you can then turn your attention to what's going on inside you. You do a check-in. Check in to your parts of your personality. What's happening? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling really excited? And think what children would respond. Perhaps you've caused a, a brain break, and the ch one child says, oh, I've really lost it. My amygdala's given me an amygdala hijack, and I'm really losing it, so I've got to calm myself down for the rest of the lesson. So you know what's happening in you, inside you. How often do we ask children to check in to their internal world to see what's going on? We usually talk at them about what's going on. We don't listen to them deeply. Next, once we've got that attention and awareness of what's going on, then we have an understanding. An understanding of what we need now. And often it's a value we need. Oh, if I only had some humility at this moment, everybody would stop shouting at me to say, stop showing off. So you really understand yourself. Then you have this incredible self-energy. Self-energy is not the energy that comes from various aspects of your personality. It's something that's deep within you. It's to do with your authentic nature, your authentic values that you carry with you. And that is one of the incredible in ingredients that psychotherapy, such as the internal family system, is discovering that human beings have. I work quite a lot with psychotherapists who have taught me a lot about the internal world. I would lead, like to see much more transference between educators and other disciplines, not only psychotherapy but others, because we've got a lot to learn from each other. And once you have that, you've got the ability to be an ethical leader. So by giving the children pauses, you're gradually building up a capacity in them to be self-regulated. You try it. It works. There are several pilot schools around the country. Werpleston Primary School in Surrey is a leading advocate of what I'm saying this afternoon. A pause bottle. Some children need a pause bottle. You know, it's a simple thing, just some grains or something in it. And when they, you know they're dysregulated, they've had one of those amygdala hijacks, then give them a bottle and let them watch it calm down. All sorts of little techniques to helping the child just to calm down. What I love to see is adults and teachers and TAs having these bottles for themselves too. So make your own bottle if you need one. When you have... Um, worked on values, you've worked on the modeling, the inner curriculum, the, um, the leadership of the school, the policies. Once you've got all that in place, then children start to behave and think in a different way. I'm going to show you this little clip of Sam and Emily. Uh, they are from an infant school in Surrey, and I they were showing me around the room around the school, and I asked them a question. I want you to note Emily's response, because she puts in practice the pause. Another name for that is the wisdom cycle, the ability to be still for a second, go internal, and then come out with an answer. She does this brilliantly. Let's watch Sam and Emily. Hi, Sam and Emily. We're standing in front of this number display, could you tell me about it? Uh, this is about what our values this month, and this is what it will look like if we're all responsible to the world. Right, what, what is it about? It's something that makes you a happy person, makes you nice and 
I think Emily can say more in that 30 seconds than I can in an hour. That's the result that happens. Now, some children need more support to get to that stage. I know that. It's not easy for some. It needs a lot of care, compassion with a lot of children. But they get there if you trust them if you trust them and give them the time. And of course it has an effect on parents. These are two grandparents. I happened to be in their home. And they said, oh, we've been affected by your stuff, Neil. We've got a values board for the family. And I said, oh, show me. So they showed me their values board. I go into other houses and now they have, on their fridges, they have some values. So what I appeal to families is to have a meeting about the family's values. What values are you portraying as a family? And when you get, if you're not a teacher, if you're at the office, what values is your company really having? Are they laminated values? Because since I started talking about values, of course, it's become the in thing. We have British values. And the worst values are all what I call laminated values. They're when an organization puts some values up and says, oh, these are our values. But when you dig deep into the organization, they're nowhere to be seen because those values are not lived. Values is not fluffy and easy. It's challenging at the deepest level for us as human beings. It really does challenge us. So if you think that by becoming a values-based school, it's an easy thing to do, it's not. It's not. It's challenging. Let me give you an opportunity to do something. Right. People in the room, people at home, wherever you are. Um, you're teaching a, a lesson on friendship. Now, your reception year one, teachers. All right, can you all be that? That's the lesson you're doing. Now, I want you to show me. You be the children for a moment, will you? Can you think back to when you were a year reception, year one? Can you remember that far? Now, what I'd like you to do, children, we've talked about friendship, haven't we? We've had our cuddly toys and everything, so you know what friendship is. Will you please, for me, show your friend sitting next to you what friendship looks like? Would you show friendship now? For those at home, I'm seeing some very interesting things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, can I invite you two out here, please, in front of the camera? Come on, you two. Come on. You've got to come out. Otherwise, the audience say, I'm kidding. Would you show what two five-year-olds do to show friendship? Come on, show. No, come on, show from your five-year-olds. Robert, how are you feeling today? Can I give you a hug? Oh, you can give me a hug. Oh, yes, that's, that's, great. A, that's appreciated. I love <laughs> hugs. Um, and I was going to share my teddy with you. Oh, <laughs> would you? Yes. Really? Yeah, that's fantastic. So my teddy is my best friend. I know. I think you deserve my best friend. And I know how much you love that teddy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> I asked that question in Australia, and in the front row were politicians. And I said, would you show friendship? And do you know what they all did? They turned to each other and went... <laughs> so funny. Sorry, Australians, if you're listening to that. The present government in Australia, I've got to say this, is fantastic. They're taking values-based education seriously, and I hear you're going to put it centre stage in the Australian curriculum. So thank you. And here they are, his real children. This is what five-year-olds really do. Now the serious stuff. I have, I'm fortunate to have grandchildren, and I often watch them when we're on holiday, or they come and stay with us. And I say, what's their future going to be? What's their future? 
Do you ever think that about children? What their future going to be as they walk into the future? My vision, my vision, this is me giving a TED talk, most frightening day of my life, by the way. Um, my vision is that all schools, all companies, all institutions, all parliaments will be values-based, will accept that human beings have to really think deeply about the real values that drive society and what we need for the 21st century. We need to ensure that consciousness grows. We cannot solve anything in the, for the future with the mindsets that we have. Ego is dominating everything. Someone gets power and then they rule over everybody else. What we need is a different sort of energy in human beings. The energy that will fuel a different form of consciousness which will enable us to survive on this planet. There's my yeah, one of my youngest grandchildren, Benjamin. Benjamin's on a beach down in Devon. What did Schiller say? He wrote this in his book. We don't need to know the future, but we need to have a direction, a distant star, something to be aiming for. It's difficult to see ahead, he said. All sorts of new problems will come. I have been voyaging a long time. So may it be with you. Not farewell, fair forward voyages. So he was optimistic. He was sending us out into the future, hoping that children would be okay. My vision is that the curriculum of the future will be in two circles. Think of the first circle. Let me say something about the current curriculum curriculum about knowledge, concepts, subjects, and all the rest of it. All great stuff. And right in the bottom of that circle is the human being. In a secondary school, it would be in PSHE or something. But it's a little box or a little circle. What I would like to see is two circles that overlap. One circle is about the human being so that children, appropriate to age and stage, are inducted into what a human being is. They'll learn about their internal world. They will learn about brain development. They'll know about the wonderful work of Dan Siegel, interpersonal neurobiology. They will begin to understand all that so that people will be able to self-regulate themselves, understand themselves in a way that all of us in this room were not educated to do. So that you have the real rounded human being having in the other circle the experiences which will help them navigate the world, to face the challenges of the world, to come up with the answers. I'm working with a firm in Athens in a few years, a week's time, called Accord. Accord produces most of the drugs for uh, oncology in this country. And they're very interested in what I talk about because of artificial intelligence. Who is programming the artificial intelligence that is going to govern our lives over the next few years? What are the values of the people doing it? That is a crucial question, and most of us are not thinking about it. But it's going to hit us really hard over the next five years. So thinking about those two circles, what knowledge, experiences, uh, understanding do we need young people to have, what sort of human being are we having, and then if those two circles cross over, where they intersect is something I call wisdom. What we need is the human being to be really wise. I'm optimistic. I think the planet does have a future if we can all work together for the sort of things I'm saying and 
Lots of other people are saying similar things. But we've got to make a shift quickly. Norway, Sweden, some of the Scandinavian countries I've been working with, they are further along the road than, dare I say, England. We've got to catch up. So you educators, you're the people at the forefront of the change. Work with values, work with good educational principles. Give the children the rich diet that they need. And my last question for you is, what future are you choosing for the children? Thank you all very much. Does anyone know that South Island, New Zealand? Oh, right, New Zealand. <laughs> and that is the Doubtful Sound. I was in the Doubtful Sound in December uh, last year, and uh, that was one of the moments where it wasn't raining. <laughs> it usually rains in the Doubtful Sound. But I just caught that heart coming out, and I thought, yeah. amazing, you know, I just sent a shiver down my spine at that moment. Did you recognize the baby? Yeah. <laughs> we have one new season to the um, There is time. Uh, some questions or comments that any of you might want to, to make. I'm wondering, yes. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It's fantastic, and uh, certainly very much in the in the spirit of, of these lectures and of Christine Schiller. So, so thank you. And I, I, I guess my well, my question is about about the hand. You know, you, you, you quite rightly identified uh, education systems globally and certainly here that are you know, kind of predicated on on fear that are driven by tick boxes and where I guess the common pedagogies tend to be behaviorism and instructions and, and you know so <clears throat> you know what what can we do what can what can the teachers of this school for example do tomorrow morning to to start this you know you know one of the one of the quick wins um, it's it's very hard to change the system um, but then again change has to come from within, you know. Revolutions are rarely started by people in power. So, you know, so what are, what, what, what are the quick wins that people can go to their classrooms tomorrow morning and kickstart, if you like, this? That's a brilliant question. Thank you for it. Um, the school I showed in Shepherd's Bush, won't mind me referring to them, I won't name them, but there was a teacher there, and it was a school that had its issues, and a new head teacher took over. And he was walking in the school one day, and he happened to go into this one teacher's room. And he looked, and he said, what's going on here? What I'm seeing in your room is not happening anywhere else in the school. What are you doing? And she's saying, well, I'm just running a values-based culture in the classroom. She may not have used those exact words, but that's what she meant. In other words, she was modeling herself the words. So you can be a teacher that says, yeah, I'm a values-based teacher. I believe in patience. Yeah, I believe in patience until you step out of line. Then I lose it because I get worried that if I, don't, you know, if I don't put you in your place, you will. So what I'm saying is the quickest win is to, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see if you're talking about your own classroom. And that takes, you said tomorrow morning, it might take a few more mornings because you're having to look at yourself again. And, and another thing I encouraged uh, at West Kidlington, we were very critically aware of each other. And it wasn't, a w it wasn't going into someone's room doing an observation and saying, oh, yeah, do this. It was being open. Uh, I used to say, I, give me feedback after my assemblies. You know, could I have done that better? 
Is there a way we can work together? So it's being open as an organization to learning. You become a real learning organization. So model the values really. But the other thing is to be compassionate about yourself. Hands up if you're the perfect human being. Would you put up your hand? I did have a man once who put up his hand, and I said, why have you got your hand up? And he said, well, my mum says I'm perfect. <laughs> the truth is that we're not. This values work is a journey. It's a journey of improvement. But what happens when you multiply those changes in the classroom is that the school then takes on this energy, which my wife Jane has, has said, Neil, she said, there's something special about a values-based school. Because everybody's thought about the values, so the values awareness has gone up, everyone starts modeling, and then these changes happen. Um, my research at Oxford showed that the biggest effect initially was on the adults, not the children. Once the adults got their message together, right, then it had an effect. Because your children spot inconsistent, inconsistency. If Rachel says one thing and you do another, they spot it. And what in, it's like a home. There's a lovely YouTube clip of a dad watching football. And the dad's going, yeah, yeah. And you see a three-year-old going, yeah, yeah. Copying. We copy each other. So give the children something good to copy in you. And forgive yourself. Be compassionate when you lose it because none of us are perfect. I wish there was a quick answer, but again, then you go back to leadership. The quick fixes is when leadership sees the need to do this. Some of the biggest companies in the world are now saying, Neil, come and talk to me, because the leaders see. What's been happening with values over the last 10, 15 years is that leadership has said, oh, we'll have some values. And they've got their values, and they say, right, where are this values company? And then you see what's not happening. And you speak to middle management, and they don't get it, and doesn't get it. And the problem is, it is a down there. So the first thing you do in a company is a creator this. So you don't have hierarchy. The job of a leader is to release the creative dynamic of everyone who works there. Rachel's job here is not to do anything, Rachel. Just release the creative dynamic of everyone here. And if you are able to do that, woof, you've got this energy that ha that happens. Most leadership teams are scared to death. So they have regulation, they have checks, they, they don't trust. So values basis, is it? Have I given you something there? It was a great question. I'll go right away and write a paper. <laughs> First of all, a values-based school, and then a values-based school. Um, has it changed things for the staff, the board, and the children? In what, what directions? I'd say the language is the same. So the pupils, the adults, the parents all speak the same language without actually necessarily saying those words. And I think that's the easiest thing without us actually saying to say you've got to do something. People can see it, they can feel it, and they do it essentially. Um, and I would say, you know, great being values based, values and hearts, etc. But really, it's what we believe in here and have done for many years and have worked really hard to develop as well. As you said, it's not an easy journey, but it's about getting the right people in as well. It's getting employing people who will follow the values and believe in the values themselves. Thank you. Mm. Robert. I'm wondering whether any of the Robert. Thank you. Sorry, Mark. That's okay. Um, the, we have a question from Pip. <laughs> <laughs> and his question is: What advice would you give to a young idealistic teachers coming into the profession who may struggle with the government education policy? A question of values. 
Thank you, Pip. Uh, I've missed you this evening. I was talking about you earlier, but it's nice to have that question. Um, what would I be saying? I'm hoping that this uh, young person is coming into my school uh, with a lovely collection of teachers who are going to be really working. And I, I would encourage that person really to have their own vision and to stick with it not to be put off by any transitory government or politician. Pip, you never were, were overtaken by people yourself. You always stuck to your principles, and I'm sure that's the way forward. But we need more teachers nationally to actually be standing up for what they believe. I feel the profession has become slightly, or well, more than slightly, muted over recent years. And it is about the quality of education. So, yes, we need these young people coming into the profession. It really worries me when I hear that some are put off by negative comments from people. But it's still a great profession. I see great teachers and support staff in this school at Bannockburn, and there are countless schools around. So, having resilience, keeping your enthusiasm, I hope I've kept my enthusiasm over all these years because I believe in people and I believe we can make a difference and the children of this country need to have quality teachers working with them. Thank you, Pip. <laughs> can I just ask one more question? It has to do with the different phases of education, the different key stages. My assumption would be that values-based education has as much relevance in the nursery as it does in year six. Um, would I be right? Uh, and would I, what, is the, what is the situation with regard to secondary education now? Are you finding that more and more secondary schools are interested in becoming values based? That's a really good question. Um, um, the first thing is that when I, when I first started looking at this whole question of values, I generally thought it would be something for children seven plus. I was quickly put right on that. I always feel that the younger the children, the closer they are to their essence, the truth. And as we get older, society inducts us into a lot of myths about how we are as human beings. So the younger the child, the closer they are, and they really get it. The youngest of my grandchildren sit with me and talk about values in their way, uh, like you did, Robert, when you were talking about your teddy. You know, it's the same thing. So, so young children really understand it, and it grieves me when I see the, f the most open, holistic education often is in reception, and then gradually through a school it's closed down until we get to the exam factories of secondary education. Um, your sep second part of the question was about secondary education. There are some great values-based secondary schools, let me say that first. Uh, but I think we need to, to just help them understand that it is re as relevant to secondary education as primary. Sometimes I'm given the, the feedback from secondary, oh, it's something primary schools do, not secondary, because we're engaged in preparing children to pass their examinations in subjects. So when I go back to my model, that would stop, I think. Questions. I'm just going to check, Mark. Any more online? No. No. Uh, again, to ask Mike to bring things to a close with a, a vote of thanks. Yes, folks. We're not going into an, an election at the moment, are we? But uh, just to uh, thank you very much indeed, Neil, for uh, coming here tonight. But of course, he's not front of you, really, isn't he? He's been here several times. And my initial reaction was, oh my goodness, have they heard it all before? Because there's a lot of staff here today. So first, thank you to you. But actually, thank you to you guys as well for being here. So give yourselves a clap. <laughs> By the way, uh, Mike Hayden, I, I was here a couple of weeks ago.
weeks ago. Um, I don't know if Rosie's in the audience, but uh, she, Rosie was fantastic because she helped me uh, do some recording to find out children's perception of their idea about the future, so their vision of the future, which is great. So um, we'll, we sorted out the versions, we're just finishing the editing, so that's also going to be on the summit videos as well. And of course, you will recognise these kids because they're of all different ages from the, the leadership group. So for that reason, I do urge you to, to watch that. Now, Neil said to me before he came and spoke to you, and we had a jolly good chat, I think, he said to me, I've, I've stood on the shoulders of giants. He mentioned Richard Frey, who is one of the first philosophers of education in this country. I know I've read several of his books. Then Marsh, another giant. But hey guys, I think Neil here is a giant in his own right. I mean, he's been preaching this, almost like a missionary, all over the world, hasn't he? Values-based education. So I think we need to say collectively, Neil, you are a giant. Are you ready? Neil, you are a giant. So there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't think that. Um, and I'm really pleased you quoted Schiller. Now the Schiller book is actually for sale. I wouldn't be a very good chair if I didn't mention the fact that, that it's only five pounds and it is available from the NAEP office. If you go up to the NAEP website, you will see the email. So if you fancy a copy before they run out, because NAEP actually got them printed because we think so highly of Schiller. Um, so please think about that. And also all the other summit videos, um, including Dr. Uh, Neil Mercer and uh, various other people who've got so much to say akin to what you've been saying tonight. So it's really nice to listen to what you say, listen to those 11 long videos that we've got out there for you. Um, and uh, if you're a member, it's only 10 pounds. And they're there for the entire year. So I do uh, urge you to dig in and pick up a video which you think would interest you, or maybe it's something you're studying at the moment. So please have a look at that. So thank you very much indeed. And there's a lot of food left over. I don't know if it's going to be recycled at lunchtime. So please have some food before you go. But actually, I've got a very special thanks to say to wonderful head teacher here and to you because we've got some a side of spring so thank you very much indeed for your office and their abouts and also not much but for the staff room or thereabouts because you are all here for yeah. being here tonight you know, on all days, of course. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. And uh, we, Nate, here collectively, are going to clap for you, Neil. Thank you, and also for you for being here tonight. Thank you. Very much. So thank you so much to, to Neil for such a fantastic and uh, and inspirational conversation. Let me just bring myself back there. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much for everything that you've contributed to this. Um, just as a reminder, if you want to have access to everything else related to the summit, nape.org.uk forward slash summit. Thank you so much. I will let you get and enjoy the rest of your evening. And I will be inside our summit talking about the, some, of the, some of the presentations and also with our four live discussions, which are all going to be remote. So we'll have the opportunity to have those conversations and bring some Q&A in as well. So thanks very much. And we will be back soon, very soon.